welcome your eminence. Archbishop Fring, let's give a clap offering to his eminence as well. My brother from another mother. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. I was expecting First Lady to come today. You, get, you must bring her down next time. Okay. Okay. She's busy. She's doing things. God bless. God bless her. Praise the Lord. I have a reader, before we actually come into the program, I have a reader that's going to expound upon the scripture reading, what we're going to share, the scripture we're going to share on uh, for the next few moments. And later on, we're going to move on to the other items as well. So who's my reader? Who's reading the scripture? Well, you're welcome, Katie. God bless. Let's give the Lord a clap offering for her life. Um, good morning, church. I'm Katie. Um, today I'm going to be reading from Luke, chapter 13, verses 6 to 9. He also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit in it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, Look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and found none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also, until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well, but if not, after that, you can cut it down. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. Wonderfully read. Thank you very much. God bless. Many people know this parable, but let's just expound upon it and get a deeper meaning and significance what this actually means. And it really relates to us today. It's not far distant 2,000 years ago. This relates to us in the 21st century, we can connect to what Jesus is saying because Jesus transcends time. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So what was true with God when he was born, when Christ was born approximately 2,000 years ago, is true still today. He hasn't changed. World change, attitudes change, philosophies change, ideologies change, but God's word remains eternal, the same, unchangeable. Praise. He's complete. You cannot perfect that which is perfected, and that's God. Praise the Lord. Amen. And he expounds on this parable, speaking about bringing us into the narrative, what he actually wants to say about the human condition that he encountered when he came into the world. So he uses this, this image of a fig tree in the vineyard. I want to see what, how we are represented in this fig tree. I want to just take this journey, take it slowly. Let's see what God is actually saying, what the word of God is actually saying. He begins, he begins by giving them this parable and saying, a certain man had a fig tree. In fact, the Greek doesn't actually say that. I don't want to burst anyone's bubble. It doesn't actually mention a certain man. It says someone. Okay, so verse 6, he says, Elogon the daftin din baravolin, sigin ichen dis endo ampelo, ampeloni, ampelo. Uh, there was a fig tree in the vineyard, but someone, it doesn't say a man, it just says someone has a fig tree in the vineyard. And he says that fig tree, about that fig tree, it's barren, it's not producing fruit. And we need to reflect and meditate ourselves, what does this tree represent for each one of us? Because when Jesus came into the world, in fact, he found the world in a particular condition of unrighteousness, rebellion, and opposition to God's principles, God's statutes, and God's love. In fact, when we read the prophet Malachi, uh, sorry, Micah, chapter 7, verse 1, I want just to think, let's just take this slowly, this journey slowly, just to get what the Word of God is actually saying to us. He says, Woe is me, for I am like those who gather summer fruits, like those who glean vintage grapes. There is no cluster to eat of the first ripe fruit which my soul desires. And verse 2 says this, interesting, he says this, the faithful man has perished from the earth, and there is no one upright among men. They all lie in wait for blood. Every man hunts his brother with a net. Interestingly, if you just look around the world today, this is the attitude of humanity. It's to destroy, it's to attack, hate on each other. Where's this love? Unrighteousness, ungodliness. Everything opposes what God represents what God wants for humanity. He wants unity, but humanity wants divinity, uh, di division. 
And so this relates not just 2,000 years ago or 4,000 years ago, but it relates to us today. There's conflict all over. Just turn your television screen on, your news rules, and you see humanity is at loggerheads with each other. There's conflict. Everyone is trying to kill someone. And when my dear, beloved brother comes from Palestine or Israel, whatever we want to name it, we see the war. It's a center of conflict at this present moment. The place, the holy land where our Lord was born is under conflict as we speak now. It begs, it begs the question, how do we reflect what God is saying? The word of God is so true and we need to re- connect to what God is saying to us and we need to apply it in and through our lives. So as we take this journey, what is God saying to us through this parable? He tells us here, he says that, that someone, uh, someone had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. Then he says, then he said to the keeper of the vineyard, look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down, why does it use up the ground? So he says, for a three-year period I was coming tending this fig tree and it's not produced fruit. How many times, how long in relation to humanity does God have to work with us in order for us to produce fruit? I'm not just speaking about tangible fruit like the orange or the apple or the pear. I'm talking, it's something that talks beyond itself. It's a metaphor speaking about something else. What fruit does God desire in and through our lives? And God is working for different periods, different times. God, we say, God is the God of the again. He always gives us a second opportunity. When Samson failed God, he gave him a second opportunity. When he's a prison in a mill house, turning the mill, grinding the wheat, he gave him a second chance when he'd come to his right mind and he prayed to God. He says, give me my strength one, this one last time so I may fulfill my purpose. God is the God of the again. And when Peter himself, Simon by Jonah, failed God, failed the Lord, denied him, he gave him a second chance, met him at the shore of his life. And we're told here for three years, he keeps tending to this fig tree. Have we... Can we relate to this? Is God speaking to our lives? Are we producing fruit, the fruit that God desires? Often it's interior, it's it's to satisfy ourselves. Everything we achieve is for our own benefits. But when God comes into our lives, it's not just about taking, it's also about giving out. Because the, 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 the word of God tells us the more you give out, the more you have left. The less you give, the less you have. That's the biblical physics and, and science and arithmetic, if, if you like. The more you give out, the more you have left over. When they fed the 5,000 men plus women and children, they had five loaves of bread and two fish. By the end of it, they had 12 baskets. Well, if you had five and two make seven, they had, seven, they had 12 left over, more than they began with. I wish I'm speaking to someone. You cannot outgive God. Yeah, you cannot outdo God. And when we do something good, praiseworthy, Solomon says, cast your bread upon the waters, and after many days you'll find it will come back to you in, in abundance. He says, what you sow, you reap. So what we put out comes back to us in different ways. It may not be mandatory terms, because often we define success and achievement through material things, material channels. But it's not always, a, it might be a, a spiritual disposition. We might have a peace that surpasses understanding that someone who's a billionaire can never achieve it. He cannot buy peace. You cannot go to the supermarket and say, can I have a pound of peace? You cannot say, can I have a pound of joy? You know, it's something acquired within ourselves. It's a spiritual disposition that changes everything. And it's, it's working, co-working with God. You know, I was speaking to a church. I was in Wellingborough last week, and I was speaking at Bishop Eric's church. And often we make assumptions. We, we think that when someone dresses with a collar and a purple shirt, we think that he is a man of God. And sometimes that's a false assumption to make because the devil can dress up like me. Let's fancy dress. Just because I'm dressed in a... It doesn't make you godly. It's the relationship that makes you godly. It's not what you're wearing. It's who's in you that makes you the man or woman of God that God wants for you. I wish I'm speaking to... You see, the thing is there, there was a fake flower. It was a rose. It was made of plastic. But it looked like a flower. It looked like a rose. And I picked it up and said, look, this looks like a rose. It has all the elements of the rose. But it's fake. So you need to see the lifestyle. A tree is known by its fruit. And we see the fig tree, no fruit. 
Interesting. Amazing, because what does a fig tree also represent? If you go right back at the beginning, when Adam and Eve disobeyed God, what did they do when they transgressed God's instruction and, 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 and commandment, if you like? What, did, what happened? Everything changed, and they were afraid they hid themselves, and they sold fig leaves and covered their shame. Fig leaves. No fruit, fig leaves. And the fig tree represents sometimes excuses. Just the leaf represents excuses. Yet, or just self-justification, or playing the blame game. And we need to come to God as we are and say, Lord, change us and help us be transformed and actually be fruitful in the way you want us to be fruitful, not how we define being fruitful is about. Because my success in my natural self may not be success in God. Yeah? We've got to evaluate this and see what, the, what, what God is actually saying to us. So he says this. Then he said to the keeper of the vineyard, Look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and found none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? He says, Look, I've given up on it. So the owner of the vineyard wants to give up. But the carer, the one who looks after the fig tree, says, Look, give me a bit more time. And God is a God of grace. He gives us a bit more time to get ourselves right. I wish you get this. Get this when you get home. God is giving us more time. Hallelujah. The time of grace. We are living in the the period of grace at this moment and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Amen. To help us facilitate for us to be transformed and to truly become fruitful in God. Give me some more time. But I have to do something for this fig tree to be fruitful. I have to, something has to be done. I cannot just leave it because if you do what you did, you're going to get what you got. If you keep repeating what you did and what you do and expect a different outcome, that's insanity. So you need to change something. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to dig around it. Then I'm going to do something. I'm going to add something to help it on its way. So when, we, when we're unfruitful, God will do something to help us become fruitful. He has to first take something away. And then he has to add something for us to be empowered and to be transformed. You get this when you get home. Watch this. What does he add? Fertilizer. Manure. Dung. Unpleasantness challenges adversity and that adversity helps us to grow because what does not kill us makes us stronger you see the thing is I have great athletes in front of me these athletes cannot achieve what they want to achieve unless they're going to the gymnasium and break themselves down to build themselves up they need to break their muscles down in order to the, the tissue to come down with the right proteins to become stronger than what they what they are or what they were yeah, It's a process that God takes us, and he takes away the things that we think are good, and he brings things that we don't like. He takes us out of our comfort zone in order to challenge us, to get us, allow us to evaluate where we truly are and what we truly want. Oh, it's profound. It's powerful. What is happening, the lessons that Jesus teaches are profound. If we just embrace these lessons will be truly transformed because things are not always what they seem. And he begs the question, do we truly want to be fruitful or do we, are we happy just existing in where we are? Because if we want to be transformed, something has to change within our inner person. Amen. And God helps us in the process. Not all challenging things in life are from the devil. You get that when you get home. When we have a storm in our life, it's not always the devil bringing the storm. And we think when something bad happens, sometimes that's a parenthesis. God sideswipes us to get our attention sometimes because we'd never listen to him unless we had that challenge that we are going through, we are encountering. Perhaps someone here today is going through a challenge. Let me tell you, just sit back, step back, take a step back before you take a step forward. God is stepping back to set you up for something greater. Evaluate what am I going through? What's the lesson I can learn from my experiences today to empower me, to equip me, to move forward? In a, in a more positive way. 
Because all the storms are not always from the enemy. Yeah? You know when Jonah, God called Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach repentance? What does Jonah do? He leaves and goes towards Tarsus. He goes the opposite direction where God wants him to go. And what happens when he gets on the ship to get away from God's calling? God brings the storm about in order to get him back to where he wanted him to be. And sometimes storms are to get our attention that God wants to speak to us. So not every storm is negative. There's a, posi- there's a positive element to storms sometimes to get our attention. And we become better for it. But the wisdom is to be in the right place to understand more about our journey and our purpose and our mission and our assignment. Because everyone here, without exception, and people watching live stream, you have a calling on your life. Everyone is called. But do we choose, do we accept that calling in God to serve his purpose in whatever capacity it is? Some in one way, some in a different way. But God is calling everyone to serve his purpose. Are we prepared to embrace the call of God? I'll give an example of the Apostle Paul. That Apostle Paul had great credentials. He was a Roman citizen. He had Jewish ancestry. He was a Pharisee from the tribe of Benjamin. His qualifications were without question. He studied under Gamaliel, one of the greatest teachers of his day, theological teachers of his day. And he thought he had everything going for him, but he was still empty. He was religious, he was religious, he was going through the rites and rites and ceremonies, but he didn't know the Lord he was supposed to be serving. And God brought a storm in his life to get his attention to change his direction. Because the, 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 there's a, a way that seems right to man, but its end is death. But there's only one true way that brings to life, and that is Jesus Christ who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And he encounters him on the Damascus road. And what does the Lord do to him the, the, of the offset? Let me say something to you. When God met him, the, Jesus meets him, what does he do to him? What's his experience? He was blinded for three days and three nights. And he was sent to a street called Straight to meet another apostle, disciple, by the name of Ananias. And God spoke to Ananias and says, I've, got, I've separated this Paul of Tarsus, or Saul. His name was Saul before he came, became Paul because the word soul means ask of. The word Paul means little. I've humbled him in order for him to serve my purpose. Because unless I humble him, he cannot serve my purpose. Unless I take him through the storm for the refining process, he cannot serve my purpose. I've got to get rid of him and make myself manifest in him. Because it's God working in us and through us that makes a difference. I can, without him, I can do nothing. He's the vine. We are the branches. Unless we, prepare, we, we produce fruit, we'll be cut off, pruned and cut off. And he, he meets Paul, and the first encounter he has with God, he asks him, who are you, Lord? Can you imagine? He's supposed to be serving the Torah, the revelation from the Torah is from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's the theophanic encounter that Moses and the patriarchs have. The writing he's reading, he encounters the author, the agency of the word, the I am, because when, 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 when God meets um, uh, Moses in the wilderness, Exodus chapter 3, he, Moses asks his name. He says, I am. Tell him I am has sent you. And he doesn't qualify. He's what? I am what? What are you, Lord? I just am. Jesus qualifies. He says, Ego imi o, o, do, o actos. I am the bread. Ego imi e alithin, I am the true vine. He says, Ego imi e o dos, I am the way. He, he qualif- Jesus qualifies everything that God began speaking to Moses, completes the conversation through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, now in our generation. Praise the Lord. So the one he was reading, because Moses wrote about him, Saul becomes Paul, Paul was versed in the scripture he should have known him, but he asked the Lord, who are you, Lord? And the first thing he encounters, he was blinded for three days. Can you imagine a person who had all the authority? Everyone was, was at, the, at his beck and call. He said one word and everyone ran to serve his purpose. Yet he needed people to help him, now guide him. He made him helpless. And that helplessness is an empowerment sometimes to show that we're not all that. Humility is power because he who humbles himself will be elevated and he who elevates himself will be humbled. And Paul was humbled before God can... 
And we all have to sometimes go through a process of refining before God could use us in power to let his, his, his supernatural resurrection power flow for us. He has to humble us because then we get all the glory ourselves. Look how wonderful I am. Look how important I am. Look what I've achieved. I haven't achieved nothing. Without God, I can do nothing. And if your life's changed, it's not because of me. It's because of your openness to God's word that will change you. Because the word of God has power. There is power in the word of God. Hallelujah. So Paul did not have a pleasant experience. And he boasts all these titles. He's, he's Roman citizen. He's a, he's a Jew from the tribe of Benjamin. He's a Pharisee of Paris. He's, he's educated. He's got qualifications. A directory of qualifications. I can identify with that. Because I've got many qualifications. But they mean nothing. I don't care what the... BA or BD, MA and PH doctorate, that means nothing. They're just papers. It's what you are, the substance of what you are in God. That's what's important. Amen. Because if it was based on that, then Peter, John, James and Andrew would never be called to serve his purpose because they were fishermen and they were uneducated. Then just God educates the ones he calls. He didn't go to the university and say, who's got a PhD? Come and follow me. He went to the fishermen who were illiterate, didn't understand because he knew they were simple. They didn't complicate things. They didn't dissect God. They just took him as he was, as he revealed himself to them. And that's how we need to receive God as he reveals himself to, to, to us himself. Not what a book says about him, but what a personal testimony experience with him. And then he comes to the point, watch this. You get this, you get this. I want just, because we put great value and price on things in the world because some we pay a lot of money for something we think that's valuable yeah it's not the price tag that makes it valuable it's what the substance of it what's the merit of it you have more value than the whole world each one of you individually the world you you are you are worth more than a billion worlds to god what would it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? You are worth so much to God, each person here. Don't ever devalue yourself because of how people see you or what people say about you. Always know who, who God is in you and what God, how God sees you. That's the most important thing. And he had all these qualifications and he was quoted them. Then he came to a point. You see, the fig tree says, put fertilizer on this fig tree around this fig tree to help it grow. Put some rubbish there to help it grow because sometimes you have to go through rubbish in our lives to help us grow and help us become who God wants us to be. And if it were not for the rubbish, we cannot progress to be what God wants us to be. Yeah, watch this. Roses grow in manure. You smell the rose, it smells lovely. But where did it come from? You smell lovely because where did you come from? You came from some rubbish to be the product that God's making. Come on, come on, come on. So what does Paul say? I want, to, I, want to call it, I want you to leave these last few thoughts in your minds. Please go back and think about these things. Paul says this. All these qualifications that I place value on, all these that were so important to me, for me, they are dung. So that what I was looking, God helps us reframe things. That's rubbish. All these things are fertile, Paul, the rubbish. I'm going to use this as fertilizer now to help me grow in God. You get this when you get home. I count it as nothing, as rubbish. Not to say discard what we learn. Education is good. But if that becomes the end, it's useless for us. It's a means to somewhere greater. And we're not more important than what God has for our life because God will blow our mind when he tells us to do something. It won't always make sense, but we have to trust him. Hallelujah, praise God. And so when the Lord was speaking to the disciples, he says that you know a tree by its fruit. It's not how it looks. What does it produce? What are you producing? Are you producing love, forgiveness, you need to see what the fruits that God wants to see in each one of us, which is very important. God doesn't want to just be fixated on the gifts. I'm going to go somewhere with it, Reverend Christine and Archbishop. I'm going to go somewhere with this because it's very important because people misunderstand a few things. They think the gifts are the end, but the gifts are the means. The gifts are there to serve a purpose for something greater. Because the gifts, the devil can in person imitate the gifts, but he cannot imitate the fruit. 
Okay? I, I, I want you to think about that. He can imitate the gifts. He can speak in tongues. He can perform fake miracles. He can for, give fortune telling, give false prophecy. He can do all these things that the gifts, the mechanism that the gifts, that, that, that are used for the gifts, but he cannot love. He cannot sacrifice. He cannot give himself for someone else. Come on, come on, come on. That's what it's about. That's what it's about. You see, so that's very important that we need to understand these things. So the, the, the fruits supersedes are greater than the gifts. The gifts are a means to bring something greater about. Praise God. Amen. And this is what um, uh, the Lord is teaching us about growing in him. Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 5 verse 22. If you just turn there very quickly. Galatians chapter 5 verse 22. Amen. It says this. But the fruits of the spirit. Now this is the fruit that the 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 owner of the of the, of the vineyard wanted to see. Love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, faithfulness. Next verse. Gentleness, self control. Against such there is no law. If we have a a root of unforgiveness in our hearts, we disqualify ourselves. We've got to be always ready to forgive. Inspire. Even if we think we're justified, forgive and let God deal with the details. We need to get this, this, the, 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 the emotion of anger out of us. We need to be angry, but do not sin. Do not hold begrudgments and embitterments. We need that to deal. We need to allow, allow the Holy Spirit to deal with that within us. That we can be loving, forgiving, bring peace. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. Watch how Jesus phrases. He didn't say, blessed are the peacekeepers. He said, blessed are the peacemakers. Think it. You try and keep peace, but God wants you to make peace. When you see two brothers at loggerhead or brother and sister at loggerhead with each other, be a peacemaker. Diffuse it. Don't put more fuel on the fire and stand back and watch them explode, consume themselves. Try and be a peacemaker. That's what God wants. Where there's peace, where, where there's conflict and trouble, we bring peace. This is why the world, it says, it says blessed are the peacemakers, for they should be called, what should they be called? The source of peace is God. He's the prince of peace. You should be called sons of God. Now watch this. Look at the world around us. Everyone wants trouble. What is the source of trouble? Jesus said to the Pharisees, you are of your father the devil who was a liar and a murderer from the beginning. So depending on the outcome, your attitude, what outcomes you want to see determines your parentage. If, you're, if you have divine lineage and connection with God, you naturally have these attributes. Where you see conflict, you bring peace. Where you see unforgiveness, you try and encourage to change people's hearts. Yeah? When the Israelites were in the wilderness and they were going from Egypt to Canaan, they came to a place called Mara. Who knows the scripture? Yeah? They came to a place called Mara. The word Mara means bitter. Okay, incidentally, Mara is the root word for the name of Mary, who birthed Jesus. Give me a bit of allegory and, and etymology. So that's the root of Mara, is the name Mary. Oh, Martha comes from the word Mara. And the word Mara means to be bitter. And when they came to the waters of Mara, and they couldn't drink the waters, they thought they were going to thirst to death. And they could start grumbling, complaining against Moses and against God. You took us out of Egypt to let us die from thirst in the wilderness. So God, Moses cried to God, and God says, you reach out and get that tree. The Greek word is xylon. And that's the Greek word, xylon represents a xylon, which is mentioned, the word for tree of life in, in Genesis is xylon. He says, reach out and get that wood and put it in the water. When he got the wood and he put it into the water, the waters became sweet and they could consume them and quench their thirst. Things change. And the, 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 the message, the meaning of this is this. That represents the cross of Calvary. When we come to the cross and allow Christ to come into our lives, it changes our bitterness to sweetness. It changes our inner person. We can become transformed. Our outlook changes and we have a paradigm shift. 
And that's what Paul had, a paradigm shift. His outlook was completely transformed. Now, before he was looking through the lens of the flesh, of carnality, of religion, of rules and rights, now he's looking through the lens of the Holy Spirit that changes everything. Because once he was an enmity with God, he was an enemy to the Christian church, now he became a brother and a co-worker to serve the purpose of God. And the difference is the fruit of the Spirit. When we allow God to permeate us and operate in us and through us, we are transformed. It doesn't lessen our life. It doesn't diminish our joy in the world. It increases it. But you don't know until you get there. We don't know the joy of the Lord until we have that relationship with him. And I tell you, he's the best person to me, better than me. I know some of you might have good opinions about me, but I'm telling you, Jesus is better than me. You need him as your friend. He never leave you nor forsake you. Yeah, believe me. That's what's important. Amen. So when we have that divine connection, things begin to change. But he helps us. He's been for, if you're on your third year, perhaps you're watching live stream, you're on your third year, and you're still not experiencing a, a breakthrough, do not take courage. Do not become disheartened. There's opportunity. Today is your day. Today is your time. But, but. Let me say to you, let me put a, a spiritual health warning with this. It will get uncomfortable before God comforts you. He, he makes you uncomfortable in order to comfort you. He'll take some things away that you think are precious to you. You're holding on to them. So he has to clean around and take the things that are not right for you. And then he'll put some things that you think they're not pleasant. That's not, that's not what you want. Yeah? Whatever. That's not what you want. But that's what you need. David said, the Lord is my shepherd, I should not want. Why? Because God provides all his needs. It may not be what I want, but it's what I need. I'm going to just drop a few more thoughts in your mind just to show you some very profound biblical uh, revelations of the word of God. Sometimes the things around our lives, we don't know we need them until a particular time. When they become, they stand out and we, and we come to a place that there's no other option for us. You see, Zacchaeus was a short man of stature. And he, Jesus was passing through Jericho, coming out of Jericho, passing through where he, the region he was. And he couldn't see Jesus because there was many crowds around him. Now, Zacchaeus was short of stature. And he looked and he saw a sycamore tree. Okay, this is Luke chapter 19. You can read the reference when you go home. And he saw this sycamore tree, and he ran ahead of the crowd, and he climbed the sycamore tree. But I can tell you this. I can guarantee you, I'm confident of this, that Zacchaeus saw that sycamore tree every day of his life passing that road. He never thought he needed that tree. And there's something around your life, or people around your life, you pass them, cross their path, or around somewhere, every day of your life, you don't think you need them. But there come a time that you think... I overlooked the value of that person. I overlooked the value of what I have at home. And I'm looking elsewhere, but what I need is in front of my nose, and I'm looking further away. And that day changed his life. The thing that he passed every day he thought he didn't need, that day became important, became relevant in his, re relevant in his life, that he climbed the sycamore tree, and by virtue of him climbing the sycamore tree, Jesus had to stop to look up to say, oh, you've got to get this in your mind's eye and see what's going on. Zacchaeus is short. Jesus is God incarnate. He fills the heaven and the earth and the universe and everything and yet Jesus had to stop and he said and Jesus looked up and saw short Zacchaeus became a giant why because of his faith and when you have faith you become a giant in the spiritual realm come on so when you have battles with demons become that giant of faith climb your sycamore tree and the devil will be afraid and won't even be able to look up you flee he'll be tormented yeah, God wants to do things in our life. And this is why this passage in Luke chapter 13 about the fig tree. Allow our fig tree today. Get the right nourishment, the things. There are things around your life you thought you didn't need them. They're there to help you grow. Praise God. And they're there to empower you. You might sometimes overlook them because something looks more value than what you have. But you have what you need. That's, that's what's very very important. I'm going to finally go to my, 
my finishing sprint to the finish line now is coming in Matthew chapter 7. And I want to finish on these last few thoughts. Always look at the fruit. Is something fruitful? Is it fit for purpose? Matthew 7 verse 15 says this. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. I said, I said it earlier, I said, just because I'm just like this, it doesn't make me a man of God. Yes. And I don't want you to trust me because of appearance. Don't judge according to appearance. See the substance. Look at my life, lifestyle. It's lifestyle that makes the difference. Yeah? The Pharisees dressed with the long robes. They profess to be men of God, serving God, the Torah, but they were wolves in sheep's clothing. They were abusing the fold. They were abusing the community. Yeah? So we need to examine the outcome. What's the, what's the fruit of what, we, what we're saying, what we're doing, our lifestyle? That's very important. So beware. You will know them by their fruits, the way, of life, the way they speak. You just be around people for a short period of time, you'll know what their values are. You know what football team they support? You know what it's important to them? In fact, they don't even have to say they'll dress like it as well. Yeah? So do you know them? By their fruits. Do men gather grapes from, from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit. But a bad tree bears bad fruit. You cannot hide. It will come out in the process. So you give it time and you'll see the outcome, manifestation. So you youngsters, by then wanting to get into relationships, you young people want to get married. Take time. Don't rush. Don't rush into partners. Yeah? You might find the sleeping beauty, but she'll put you to sleep. <laughs> Don't rush headlong. Take your time. Water it. Give a bit of light. And it'll grow. And you see. And that's vice versa. <laughs> a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is what cut down and thrown into the... What did the, what did the man, what did the narrative in Luke chapter 13 say? Cut it down. But God says, give it more time to, to change because we can change. We can change our attitude. We can change our minds to produce fruits of righteousness if we accept him and embrace him. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else you need, every fruit you need, every outcome you need, every blessing you need will be added to you in abundance, overflowing. Your cup will overflow. David says, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It is how I would dwell in the bar there, dwell in this. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David's words. Praise the Lord. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. And then he says, I'm going to finish on these last few snippets here in verse 21. It says this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, should enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Verse 20, 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wondrous in, wonder, wonders in your name? Watch this. He goes on to say this, verse 22. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. They all, they all claimed functioning in the gifts Get this when you get home, research it. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and read that chapter and, and parallel with this. And, and then go, no, chapter 12, sorry. Then go to chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians and then look at this in that context. And you see, these are the gifts. It's not the fruit. And then he says, he says you, you who practice lawlessness, he says. What does he mean by that? And I'm going to finish on these last thoughts. The Greek word is anomian, without law. The law is fulfilled in love. Yeah? Okay? The greatest command is love God with you, your heart, with your strength, with your soul, and with your spirit, and, and love your neighbor and your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And so it's fulfilled in love. You who function without love, because love is the fruit of the spirit. So we need the Holy Spirit to help us become fruitful. 
So don't give up. God has not given up on you. Don't give up on yourselves. If you're fruitful, share with other people. Share with your fruits with other people and encourage other people. Praise God. If you're struggling something, let me tell you, today's your day. It's not a coincidence you've been here. God is here to help you through that process, to make you fruitful, to make you transform, to change your life for the better, not temporally, but eternally. God is changing your lives, praise God, for the better. Amen. And that's what we need to embrace the Lord and take God at his word, especially on, on the landscape we see what's happening around the world. And I often speak about prophecy and fulfillment, but I'm not touch upon it today. But like, the Bible is a unique book. Don't overlook it. Don't ignore it. Embrace it. Live by it. And you'll never, you, you'll never regret it for your eternity. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's stand together as a praise thing. Come forward. God bless. Amen and amen. The grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us now and forevermore. And surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever and ever. Amen, amen, amen. Turn to someone, embrace someone in Jesus' name. God bless.